Hey, everybody. Sound good? Hear me okay? Okay, cool. I'm Justin. This is Rafa. Um, we're going to be doing a, a talk slash workshop on OpenStreetMap. So we're expecting a little bit of OpenStreetMap editing, hopefully, if anybody's interested, as well as a little bit of uh, coding. We've got some code set up. Um, and uh, yeah, let's do some quick introductions. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Rafa Gutierrez. I work for Mapbox, and I head up their support. Um, and I uh, work with a lot of users from around the world who uh, often have issues uh, regarding OpenStreetMap data to editing or JavaScript problems uh, with, with mapping. So uh, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, opportunity to really get to know how people are using the data and uh, where the issues lie uh, for the data. So um, it's a really exciting opportunity to work with OpenStreetMap and the OpenStreetMap community and, and build that data set up. So um, Justin? Um, and I'm Justin. We both, by the way, live here in Portland, work remotely for Mapbox. Um, I'm the mobile lead at Mapbox. I mostly do iOS development. Uh, and I came into things uh, from the programming side instead of the geo side. But since then, I've become pretty darn familiar with OpenStreetMap. Um, if you don't know about Mapbox, uh, we're a company doing uh, developer tools around building maps, custom maps for apps and websites. So anything from web tools to mobile tools uh, to cartographic design tools. And all of our, our world map um, stuff that we do is based on crowdsourced OpenStreetMap data. So as opposed to us building up internal processes for going out and mapping the world, we leverage OpenStreetMap and foster that community through code contributions and community support kind of contributions. And that's basically, along with other public data sources, that's how we make our world maps that you use our tools with. And so that's where our interest in OpenStreetMap comes from. Um, it basically powers all of our worldwide maps. Um, so with that, we should probably give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today and work through with the workshop. We're going to cover what OpenStreetMap is um, at the very macro level, although you probably have somewhat of a familiarity, at least with the, you know, that it's map-based and crowdsourced data. Um, and we'll talk a bit about what goes into it, like uh, infrastructure-wise and data and, and how people add to it and build and things like that. Um, we're going to encourage everybody to create a free OpenStreetMap account and start editing. We'll have a little edit break. So, and we've got a, a, a fun town picked out that we can, uh, we can do some editing with and contribute to OpenStreetMap before the end of the workshop. Um, we'll talk about data, like the formats, how it goes in and, and hangs out in OpenStreetMap and what people do with it and why that's important and it's, that it's not just a map. And then um, we'll uh, uh, do a little code break on making use of the data. And we've got some examples set up. Um, it's JavaScript based. Uh, we didn't get too deep into the programming, pretty small stuff. So even if you're not a programmer, um, you can hopefully have some fun with that. And we've got lots of launching points if you are a programmer and want to dive into it a little deeper in JavaScript or other languages. Um, and so we've got some example code you can clone down, clone down off of GitHub during the workshop and work with too. Um, but yeah, we should do an a overview of OpenStreetMap and uh, So um, OpenStreetMap was uh, a concept, an idea uh, founded by a gentleman by the name of Steve Coast in 2004. He was frustrated with the Ordnance Survey um, having all their data sort of in this um, repository that was uh, unavailable to most people. So. Uh, when he started it, uh, it started to pick up speed, and in 2006, uh, it became, uh, they had the OpenStreetMap Foundation uh, was founded, and from then on, it became known as the Wikipedia of Maps, where anybody could contribute. So currently, there's over a million registered contributors, and about 30,000 of them, 30, of them are monthly active users. So, um, and, like we're discussing here, it's not just a map. It's really the data behind it. And so when you look at that data, it's, it's overwhelming. But it's very useful and um, can be streamed to just about any source. So, Yeah, um, speaking to the point of data, this is when you go to openstreetmap.org, uh, which is the organization website, you basically see a map that looks like this. This is downtown Portland. Um, it's a pretty busy map visually. Um, the, the goal behind these. Uh, this map imagery is not as much 
used for navigation or used in apps, although some people do. This is mainly about showing the depth of the data that exists in OpenStreetMap. So when you put edits into OpenStreetMap, it's rendered back out within a few minutes out into this style. And so there's a lot going on. It's pretty busy. Uh, it's not always legible in certain cases. But the reasoning behind that is because it's basically a showcase of the richness of the data. It shows, you know, it's got uh, trimat stops and, and all kinds of little um, uh, locations, POIs, points of interest. Uh, in the database, as well as you know, waterways and highways and building outlines and all that sort of stuff. And it's, um, uh, yeah, like Rafa was saying, it's, it's, it's about the data as much as it is. Some people think of it as just this map, but it's, it's really what you can do with the data and the infrastructure behind it and pulling those things down, which is like at Mapbox, what we do is we pull down data in near real time and render that in our own maps and our own products, and we use it for things like geocoding, turning addresses into latitudes and longitudes and vice versa. Use it for directions because stored in OpenStreetMap is data like when things are one-way one streets and no left turn and all that sort of stuff. And there's a huge richness to the data. So it's not just for mapping. Um, that data could be used for, for all sorts of stuff. So um, signing up for it, you can sign up right now. Um, we'll do an edit break uh, shortly, but if you go to openstreetmap.org, uh, you can create an account. They have uh, you know, regular username, password type stuff, and, as well as open ID. And um, the, the sign up screen basically looks like this. You can use a, a display name. You can, uh, your email's hidden. You don't have to necessarily associate it with a real identity online. Um, so you can kind of choose your level of privacy. Um, but yeah, I encourage everybody to sign up, um, get the ball rolling on that, because we will do a edit break in a little bit and, um, and show you how, how things are edited and, and we can edit on an actual spot on the map and, and uh, talk about how that's done. But, um, how, many, how many users do we already oh, yeah. have? Anybody registered already? Yeah, I did mean to take, uh, take a survey actually at the beginning. How many people had heard of OpenStreetMap before hearing about this session? Okay, cool. And have any, has anybody used it, used its maps or data? A couple people? Um, yeah, cool. And then we have a, a couple people already registered. So, um, yeah. So data in OpenStreetMap. Uh, you want to talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, so largely, it's coming from individual editors, people who uh, just want to contribute to uh, their local area based on their knowledge. Um, there's also the idea of uh, conflation, where uh, we're working on a project here in Portland to bring in buildings. So that's being provided uh, as public domain data from Metro and the city of Portland. So there are efforts to bring in large data sets. So at one point, uh, the Tiger line file, which is the uh, US streets file, uh, was imported at one point. And so sometimes you'll see that um, entire uh, governments or agencies will will bring in large amounts of data. So those are, those are much more difficult to come by. Um, and the process is rather tedious. There's a whole imports committee that you work with. But it can happen. So uh, if you do work with governments or other agencies that have large amounts of data, I would encourage you to, to <laughs> speak with them and, and, and think about contributing to OpenStreetMap. But largely, it's going to come from individual editors, people who are um, used to their area, they can pull up a, basically what we'll see is a aerial view and do tracing. So they can use their traces from their GPS tracks or they can uh, just trace the outlines of buildings or trails or roads and then go through and tag them and, and uh, uh, add other attribute information that they know about those locations. There's also the idea of these sprints and edit-a-thons which are uh, really fun opportunities. People will get together and have these hackathons where they'll just pick an area or uh, like in Oakland and San Francisco, they had an edit-a-thon where they were competing, like who could do the most edits in a certain session. So uh, that's, that's happening right now. Um, and there's other groups we'll talk about later that you can join in and, and do these edit-a-thons. Yeah. I want to mention uh, two other things. The, the local knowledge bit here, this comes, um, it's in quotes because it comes from uh, OpenStreetMaps page, they, they really prefer when somebody on the ground who lives in a particular area contributes the edits to those, area, uh, uh, those areas. It's not, you know, it's not like the only way they're going to do it, but they'll, um, a good example of this is um, some folks came in and were, were kind of editing 
London tube stations according to a project need, and they were just kind of aligning things a little bit differently according to the way that things were, were referenced underground. And it turns out the local London community said, no, no, it should be this way because that matches up with the way everybody understands local maps to work. And so it was a very slight difference. It, neither one was wrong per se, but they, they went with the one that the Londoners had, had gone with because it just fit the context of how they understood their space. And so um, you can map anywhere in the world that you want. And in particular, um, there's a lot of things done with uh, humanitarian infrastructure, like post Haiti earthquake, post uh, Banda Aceh, Indonesia earthquake. People will come in and do edits based on rapidly updated aerial imagery so that you can d determine which roads are blocked and which roads are still up and things like that and become a really useful tool from the ground up, which is much more powerful than tasking somebody top down to go out, go out and do it. Um, the other thing about uh, places that data comes from, a really cool use that I've seen recently is college campuses that need to create a campus map, whether it's for mobile apps or the website. I mean, they al almost always have it on the website. I've seen a couple, like University of Wisconsin uh, did an interesting version. Um, uh, University of Colorado did this, where they basically would bring students in as part of class time to map based on aerial imagery tracing, bring that into OpenStreetMap, and then bring that back out into custom map tiles that the university was using as part of their, their campus. And they would get all their buildings mapped. Like, the streets are basically all there in any major metro area in the U.S., generally. Um, but they were able to map all the buildings and all the details and the footpaths and the quads and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's been a really interesting way that... Um, everybody can benefit because the colleges have resources in the form of students and other interested people contributing to it and then they get a great campus map out as can every other OpenStreetMap user. Um, and yeah, users, we should talk a bit about the, the sorts of folks that are using OpenStreetMap data. So th this can be a number of uh, individuals or governments like, like I was talking about, but also some businesses are now using this in their applications themselves. So like Foursquare, Pinterest, Craigslist, you'll see uh, a number of these large organizations using OpenStreetMap because they know that the quality of the data are there and that it can be easily contributed to. So if you don't see your store location or your business on, on OpenStreetMap, you can just go in and edit it and then it's live within about five minutes. So um, it's, a, it's a valuable resource for not just um, individuals but also large businesses are also now leveraging this. Yeah, I've seen everything from um, just based on POIs, points of interest, to uh, polygons. I think Flickr did some stuff. Uh, and I know there's a, a uh, Portland company, Urban Airship, you might be familiar with, that does push notification and other mobile services. They did something similar to what Flickr was doing, where they were using OSM polygons to help uh, when you were in your control panel setting up um, geofences. So you could, you could, you could set for, a, as a, c a customer of Urban Airship, you could set uh, a chance to do a push notification when a certain segment of users was inside of a stadium. And so in that tool where their customers would set up that push notification, they could use OSM polygons to help select the stadium and select the actual bounds. And should it, instead of just saying the center point with a radius, they could actually pick the physical shape of it using the polygon data that was in OSM. So there's a lot of neat uses um, for uh, for the, the raw data like that. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly on, on how stuff is stored. I mean, it's, un under the hood, it's a, a lot of databases and, uh, you know, relational databases, as you'd imagine. I'm pretty sure it's post-GIS based. Um, but if you're, if you're interested in the infrastructure at all, in the OpenStreetMap wiki, you can go to the servers node, and there's a lot of info on all the individual servers and their, their uptimes and, and resource needs and all that sort of stuff there. It is, OpenStreetMap is not run by any particular company per se. It's a, it's a group of volunteers um, with a foundation behind it, like Rafa said, that, that's helping guide it and fundraise and that sort of thing. But it's basically, a, 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 you know, it's got a lot of contributors and a lot of volunteers who help with the infrastructure and the data and, and, and imports and exports and all that sort of stuff. So this is a good URL to check out. Um, if you're interested in the infrastructure. Um, licensing, we'll just touch on it briefly. Um, we mentioned it's pretty freely available. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a complicated issue at times. Uh, it is an open data commons, um, open database license, ODBL. Um, you are free to copy, distribute, transmit, and, um, but we do, or we as in the community, uh, do require attribution whenever it's used, and uh, there are there are uh, 
plenty of documentation or um, if you're using uh, like a Mapbox JavaScript library, that's included. So you always see on the bottom of the maps, uh, you know, copyright OpenStreetMap contributors. So we're always crediting the community. And uh, this is an important thing and uh, there is a bit of uh, policing around it. We, you know, we want to make sure that people understand this is part of the open source initiative. So. Yeah, the only other bit, the last point here is if you, if you were to take wholesale a copy of the data and alter, alter it as opposed to combine it with another source, um, it's a somewhat viral license in that you would have to release that data back out again. So um, if that doesn't fit with the terms of you know, the, the sort of project you're working on, you want to make sure to do a combination versus an actual altering of the data. It works more similarly to, say, the GPL than a BSD or MIT style license. Um, but in general, if you're just pulling stuff out and mapping it or using it in, in those commercial sorts of applications like uh, we mentioned before, copyright OpenStreetMap contributors is enough, um, and you can link off to OpenStreetMap to provide more info. But um, basically, yeah, always attribute it. And like Rafa said, the tools we're going to show have that automatically built into the map, but um, that's an important thing because uh, this is a lot of contributors over 10 years now building up this map and updating it over time. Um, so data is licensed. Do you want to get data back out? Um, there's a resource on, uh, on OSM called Planet OSM, and this is basically um, uh, the, the resource for, uh, it's kind of an endpoint of sorts of getting all the, the data in various formats that you'd want. Um, there's everything from a near real-time feed, which you obviously need a fair amount of resources to hook up to, onto like snapshots, you know, d data downloads. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a couple different formats. Um, uh, we've got uh, PBF is basically protocol buffer format. It's a binary compressed format alternative to XML, but they do come out as flat uh, OSM XML as well. To give you a sense, um, these are updated on a weekly basis, so you can grab the entire world via OpenStreetMap in XML or protocol buffer. Um, it's roughly 400 gigs in XML. Um, uh, so if you do, you know, you can, you, there's uh, various projects to import that into a relational database like PostGIS, PostGIS. Um, uh, but it's relatively weighty data. So generally, for most applications, most uses, um, extracts are more useful um, than the whole, you know, the whole hog. Yeah, these uh, extracts are actually really uh, important to to know about. Some people want to download the entire data set, and you can just get it just for your region. So if you do go to Metro Techno. I don't know how to say that, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a great site that's already parsed out quite a bit of regional data so you can get like your state or your country. Um, they are fairly large still, but um, definitely more manageable. And then there's also other formats uh, that you can pull out like shapefiles if you're familiar with GIS or GeoJSON, which is a key, basically uh, geospatial for JSON. So it's a... Uh, um, these extracts are, are available, so don't go downloading the entire planet. So, Yeah, I, I, would, I would say like a metro area, like if you wanted to download all of Portland and make your own Portland map, I think it's on the order of like 100 megs, something like that, to grab an extract in, in a relatively compact format like Shapefile. GeoJSON's a little more verbose because the trade-off there is human readability. You can open it in a text editor and look at the latitudes and longitudes and the polygons and things in the, in the data. Um, so the example that we're going to do is with a relatively small data set in GeoJSON, just so you can see it transparently and, and figure out what's what's involved in the data. But um, extracts are the way to go. Both the MapZen and the uh, Metro Tech TechZo, which is run by a guy named Mike Magursky, um, those are both volunteer efforts. They put up the server. They do this stuff also on a roughly weekly basis, and both have a really nice um, index page where you can. Um, they have a little like they've got. Hundred, hundreds of cities uh, across the world, and they've got a thumbnail of which city they're talking about, so you can distinguish between Portland and Portland, Maine, um, and then various formats to download below that, whether you just want to get the straight XML that they've already cut up from the big Planet OSM dump, or these converted formats like GeoJSON or whatnot. Um, yeah, so you're probably thinking, okay, how, how do I edit this? Like, what do I have to install? Um, how would I put stuff into OSM? Um, and basically, uh, that you could do this right on the web. There's some uh, really high-end, uh, really pleasant to use web-based tools for editing. Um, uh, and the, the current default is a project uh, called ID, or the id editor, which is itself open source on GitHub. 
and you can contribute to it. It's D3 based, if anybody's familiar with that library. So it uses, it, it uses D3 to, to allow you to trace over imagery and draw vectors in the browser in a really high, highly performant way and then save that back out as a snapshot with your change notes. It works similar to version control where you make an edit by tracing or drawing and then save that with a, com a, a comment and that goes in as a change set number. Um, anything you want to add about ID? Well, there is, um, on the web, that's probably the easiest way to get to an editor. There are other methods. There's a, a potlatch editor, which is sort of a legacy editor. Uh, Jossum, which we might cover a little bit of. And, uh, and uh, QGIS as well. So you can bring in data from QGIS and contribute back. So these are editors that are um, available for download as separate uh, packages. Uh, this is a Java-based desktop editor, and uh, QGIS is a pretty large, substantial uh, GIS piece of software. Yeah, just quick interface tour. Um, uh, when you're browsing OpenStreetMap, so this is OpenStreetMap.org, centered over Portland again. So the only thing in the URL is just the latitude and the longitude and the zoom scale that we're at right now. You can go up to this Edit button. Click it, and then you've got a couple defaults. The other in-browser editor, Potlatch, or to bring down uh, you know, a desktop-based application. But the default is edit with ID, the in-browser editor. And that's all you have to do. Um, it'll ask you to log in or sign up and log in if you haven't done that already. But anytime you're browsing around and looking at what's on OSM, you can just switch over into editing mode pretty transparently. And that looks something like this, where you're still on the same site. You can see I'm logged in in the top right with my avatar way up in the top right. And then let me get over here point a bit. Um, so this again is downtown Portland and we've got, it's got satellite imagery underneath and you can, you can go to a layers menu and you can choose other, there's, there's Bing, there's Mapbox Satellite, there's um, MapQuest I think provides a layer and you put that underneath the map and then like all these buildings in pink are polygons that are in the data set that are live editable polygons in the browser. And believe it or not this is actually really performant. It's, it's a really well put together project. But um, we'll go over this with a, with a bit of a live demo and a break for editing but you could choose amongst a point, a line, or an area, and you just start drawing on this map as a canvas or editing what's there. So here I've clicked on a building and I have a little radial menu that popped up and I can find more details about it. Um, and you've got to undo and redo buttons. And then back over here on the side panel. So I've, collect, uh, I've selected a road, it's a tertiary road, a name, Southwest Stark Street. It's a one way, so the checkbox is on. Speed limit is left empty, but you could add that sort of info. There's all kinds of metadata. Um, you can indicate the structure, bridge, tunnel, um, that sort of thing. And we'll talk a bit about the kinds of metadata that go into the editing. But this basically all happens in, in line, you know, in the left of the, of the browser window that you're looking at as you're editing on the canvas on the right-hand side. Um, so we talked about JASM. We're going to focus on ID because it's in the browser. You don't have to install anything. Um, there's also a couple mobile um, applications. I, I surveyed a fair amount. I haven't used a ton of them. Uh, I'm more an iOS person as an iOS dev, but uh, there's a great app called Pushpin for uh, mostly for POI, so point-based versus like drawing buildings or editing buildings or, or streets. It's more based around locations of uh, uh, points. Um, and on Android, the best one I saw was Vespucci, which I think is open source. Um, I forgot to look, but it's on Google Code, so I would expect that it is. Um, you can grab it through the Play Store. And uh, that one's a little more full-featured. I was using it on a tablet, and so it allowed me to do uh, a few more things. But you can do, I mean, OSM editing, it, it's probably easier to, to do it while you're sitting at a, at a desktop or laptop computer, but the capabilities are there. And we're going to talk about some other forms of data like notes that exist in OSM that are more useful in a mobile context too. Um, so we'll come back to that. But um, we should probably talk more about the structure of how, uh, of what OSM data is. And the three big terms that you'll hear about this are nodes, ways, and relations. Nodes are basically points in space. So uh, with the example, we're going to use um, drinking fountains in downtown Portland, like public drinking fountains are mapped as nodes because they're points. Um, ways are a collection of two or more points together, so a street segment, or it could be a closed way in the form of a, of a building, uh, like four points or six points or something like that that are, that are closed polygon. Um, and that, that um, causes like a relationship between those nodes to form that building polygon or that park polygon. And then relations are a way of grouping nodes and ways in, in kind of a higher level. And the best example I saw when I was looking around on the OSM wiki was um, if you've got a national park that has multiple properties. 
like some national parks are split. A good example is, um, uh, uh, I can't think of a good example, like Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. It's two, two physical areas. Um, each of them would have you know, the park boundaries as multi-node ways, and then you could have a relation between those two ways that says this is Sequoia and Kings, Cash and, uh, Kings Canyon National Park. So it's, a way of, it's just a way of relating the two. Um, the other thing, once you're putting these in, and, and what I alluded to on the, on the left of the metadata is tagging. Um, and so you want to talk a bit about the tags that go into editing? So you'll see in the editor, there's an opportunity to con contribute basic uh, values that are uh, attributes of the, the feature, whether it's a node or a way. So uh, when you're tagging, there's a, a series of map features that you can look up. And so something like a stadium would fall under the tag of leisure, and then you would give it the value of uh, stadium. So th there's a number of those, and uh, it's an exhaustive list, but uh, very useful to get familiar with if you're doing uh, one particular thing. So um, drinking fountains would be amenity fountain. Yeah. And right. So uh, we'll go through those uh, tags in a moment and, and look up some of those example features. And uh, it, it can be a little uh, confusing because a lot of the termino terminology is sort of uh, British vernacular. So you'll, you'll come across things like ways or motorways, uh, which are really streets and roads in, our, in, in uh, US English. So um, I think that's. Uh, yeah, there's some pretty, pretty simple ones. Uh, it can go like there's, there's successive levels of detail, so don't be put off by the fact that there's a lot of taxonomy. And like any open source project, you know, the taxonomy is debated as well in, in forums and mailing lists and things. But for the most part, it's relatively stable. But like, say, say you're tagging a building, and you'll see this in the ID editor on the left-hand side. It makes it really easy because it provides for you in a selection interface what they are, so you don't have to know these off the top of your head and type them in. So for example, if you have just traced a polygon that's a building, you can say something as simple as building equals yes, um, and then you could be done. Or you can do building equals commercial, building equals farm uh, auxiliary, like for a barn, things like that. Um, so you can go into, and they can be multiple uh, levels. You know, most taxonomies are multiple tags. They're not exclusive. But um, it can start off pretty simple. And, and you know, any, anything is, is helping out, too. So if you could put an edit in, somebody else uh, might come across that randomly, or they might be attracted by watching a change feed or seeing that somebody has been editing near them and go and put in some time and, and bump it up to the next level and just add some more deeper taxonomy. So don't feel like you have to get it all right in the first shot or not do anything at all. Um, you, can, you can approach it in a pretty incremental way. Um, the other bit of metadata is notes. Uh, you want to talk a bit about that, and I'll mention the mobile context after. Sure. Um, notes are basically areas on the map that you can just quickly add some comment about the data. And it can be a question. It can be a problem, an issue, maybe something that uh, like I had a note that I put in the other day where it was a street and they created a divider so there was no longer access to cross the street uh, but bicycles could go through. So my question was like how do you edit that? Do you make it a bike path through or do you make a sort of roundabout? So um, it, it did require to uh, stop the traffic going through or indicate that the traffic would go through and uh, you would create a bike path, like a real tiny bike path. So it actually gives that, um, w once you edit that, um, it gives accessibility um, for the bicycles uh, when doing routing. So if, if, the, if that <laughs> actually comes around. Um, but the notes are, are very useful as well. You can turn those on and view all the notes for an area and, and go in and contribute, start editing or answering notes or helping users. So there's a lot of communication that way. Yeah, you can toggle it on in, in ID, and, and I think it was something like, I was looking at most of downtown Portland, and it was something like eight or 10 notes on there currently. So it's not super overwhelming, and the idea is you remove those if it's an issue that becomes resolved. Um, but um, the, uh, the other thing about notes is, it, it's, this is more useful for a mobile context, because you could, say, build a mobile app that lets people just flag something as needing attention and adding a comment, and, or, what, or either for themselves or for other editors on the map later without having to get into like polygon editing in a four inch mobile device, you know? So you can just say, okay, I'm centered over this point. Let me add a note. You put a little snippet of text and that goes into the notes API in OSM. I'm um, sorry, I took this. Oh, no. 
Uh, no, the only other thing, I, I think we covered uh, notes and um, uh, the tagging. The, the one thing that also I, I overlook is um, sources. When you're, when you're working in an area and uh, you're using aerial photography, uh, the background images, you can um, attribute the source information, so where you, um, where you traced from, basically. So it could be a GPS trace, it could be Mapbox satellite, or it could be your own imagery that you've geo-referenced um, somehow. So that's important and it's helpful for users to kind of go back and see, well, how, what was the quality of this data and uh, was it up to date? So uh, source information is pretty useful in that, in that sense, so. Yeah, I just wanted to mention this beginner's guide as well. Um, I forget, I think percent 27 is the apostrophe, but uh, you know, encoded URL. If you go to the OpenStreetMap wiki, you can find this beginner's guide. Um, and this talks about some of these issues around um, figuring out taxonomy and, and understanding local knowledge and just kind of orients you to the community and, and how, how the community expects, um, expects people to contribute or, or would like people to contribute. And then one other thing I'll mention here is a little bit about QA. And then we're going to get into editing very shortly. I'll start talking about the example of, of where we can break into an edit break and start playing around with ID and, and some live editing on a, a uh, undermapped town in Oregon. Um, but um, QA process, um, there, there's, a, there's a strong community around just wa Some people are, like in any community, are just really interested in watching the real-time feed and, and looking over what other people have put in. So there's, there's very, very low likelihood of things like major major um, edits like boundaries and world labels and cities getting wiped from the map and stuff like that. All the stuff can be reverted anyway. But the, the, the community is really strong around making sure that um, things are done the right way. Like Rafa was saying about this little cut through in the, in the divide, it's technically a bike path because that's used in other, other forms of use of the data to indicate that it's accessible for bikes. So if you're building a project, trying to figure out how to do bike directions from point A to point B, you've got that tiny little bit of information that lets you cut out several blocks out of your trip by cutting through this new bypass that is technically an accessible bike path. Same thing with curb ramps for handicap access, all this kind of stuff. It's really important in a lot of uses that you wouldn't necessarily know right off the bat. You think of the visual map and the data and you just want to have the buildings on there. Or you think about your uses of web and mobile applications that have maps on them, but there's a lot of other ways to slice and dice the data. And so this is a great resource to figure out kind of an orientation as to things to be thinking about when you're editing. Um, but with that, we're going to talk about Shanico. Is that how you say it? Shanico, Oregon. Yeah. Anybody know where that is? <laughs> it's in the middle of Oregon-ish. <laughs> uh, north, north middle, yeah. should say middle of nowhere. but. Um, Tiny little town used to be uh, the wool capital of the world, and um, since uh, it has decreased in size and population, now up to about 36 people, um, but largely unmapped. There's uh, a, a few buildings, like the old hotel. So this is it on OSM right now. So you see the old hotel, post office, and um, a few other homes in there, the and the streets. So uh, largely on a map, you'll find areas like this all over in rural, um, rural parts. And some are actually largely mapped, but in this case, uh, there's not much activity going on here. So we're going to look at this in more detail. And if you look at the aerial view, you can see... So there's this uh, large... This was the um, sheep... Yeah, where they would, uh, I think the old rail line actually was running through here and they were just shipping all the wool off from there. And a few other buildings, there's an old jail, there's um, some historic building, a lot of historic buildings actually. So we can actually do an edit session here and fill in some of these, some of these uh, features and show you some of the tagging, how the taxonomy works and uh, Shall we jump into the editor? Yeah, yeah. We thought we'd take a take a break. Um, get signed up for uh, uh, OSM if you're not already, if you're interested, um, as well as coffee, drink, bathroom break, or whatever. And, uh, but we'll kick off first with. Uh, uh, do you want to show show live in the editor maybe um, a little bit? Do a quick overview. And we'll s we'll swap laptops and then um, take a break just after that and uh, spend a little while editing.
just okay. So I'm logged in here to the um, OSM, and I'm going to just start an edit session here. Actually, oh, sorry. Sort of I, sh I yeah. should <laughs> search first. The nice thing is uh, OSM will remember where you last were browsing on the map when you go back to it, which is pretty cool. But if you need to get to some random place, you can do that as well. And also, if, if this is your first time, uh, you can also do the walkthrough as well, which is a fairly helpful. It just gives you some tool tips to, to get started. So I'm going to back out and quickly do a search. That's just my current location. I'm going to go to Shanico. Shanico. And behind the scenes of this uh, search tool is uh, OpenStreet Nominatum. It's a geocoder, uh, free open source geocoder that you can use. So here I am in Shanico, Oregon. And what you want to do is zoom into the areas that you're interested in editing. Uh, because if you're zoomed out too far, it's going to take a while to load or may not load at all. Did somebody edit? That's more buildings than were in there yesterday. That's somebody got a leak of the slides, I think, and knew where we were going. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> so literally, we were looking at this yesterday. <laughs> Might have to find another time. <laughs> okay, so let's see what's uh, what's happening behind the scenes here. Uh, well, let me go to edit. Or, or, or was one of you just editing like really fast? <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah, you saw my slide like that L-shaped building and the one next to it were traced, but all the, the barn and the other things weren't. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. Um, okay. so yeah, so this is in the edit mode. The, the edit at the top left is in green. You pretty much have the same tool palette on the right-hand side, the plus and minus for zooming. And then that little stacked sandwich slice of cheese icon um, that's where you can pick your backdrop. Um, so it'll default to, I think, Bing-based satellite. And these are um, like Bing and MapQuest and, and Mapbox satellite. These are imagery that's been licensed by, by Mapbox and other commercial providers to allow for tracing. Because not uh, one important thing that we didn't, didn't mention specifically is you definitely do not, and the beginner's guide does say this, you definitely do not want to be copying from proprietary maps. For example, pulling up Google Maps in another tab and then drawing those polygons in OpenStreetMap. You either want to do it by your own physical surveying with a GPS device, or like maybe you're flying a, a small unmanned drone and using that imagery, or satellite imagery, or whatever. But you want to be tracing or importing data that is authoritative, like you know, you're a part of a city and, and you've got a building you know, real estate database already, but you don't want to be tracing proprietary sources because it's got to be built up from scratch as, as a complete separate work. So anyway, so the satellite imagery has been licensed to be underneath things, and that's what we're showing right now. Rafa switched it up, and I think he's got Mapbox satellite under there right now, and then you've got the polygons on top. An area that's not, <laughs> not edited. <laughs> yeah. So we'll look at this structure here. Uh, some recognizable structure, and I'm just going to make a area feature. And as I click... I'll just add the vertices. You double click to end it. Yeah. Yep, and once it's double clicked and ended, um, I can also pull out the vertices, or if I pull out a center vertice, vertice vertex, uh, it creates two other midpoints that you can still continue to drag out. So I'm just going to undo. And so right off the bat, on the left hand side sidebar, you can quickly just uh, give it whatever entity it is. So uh, this is the, a building, and I don't know exactly what kind of building it is. So I'm just going to classify it as a 
as a just a building. Built. And this is what we were talking about before with building equals yes. That's essentially what we're doing here versus building equals commercial or whatever sort of use. Um, but it's provided for you. It, it knows that you know a point can't be a building, so it's not going to present that to you. So the editor is pretty intuitive that way. And when you're when you're in the city and you have that local knowledge of where you're at, you know, people will often give the, the common names for things. So if it's um, especially a, a business like Starbucks or something, people will write that in there. Um, building equals yes is um, the tag there. Levels is for basically how many you know stories high you have or how many how many building levels there are. Address is important for geocoding as well. So um, if we knew the address, we would plug that in. And then you have other amenities that you may uh, include there. So whether there's a phone number attached, um, any websites, or yeah, that's particularly useful for businesses. You can help build out. You can put in everything from like operating hours to business website and phone number and and Wikipedia article if it's a historic. Point. And I should also add that you can see next to the point line area, undo, redo buttons, a save button. None of this is being saved yet, so don't feel nervous about starting to you know, edit the map. Um, you can kind of play around and get a feel for things and even just experiment and not even commit the changes. Um, but it's, it's pretty flexible to let's just let you dive in and start playing around. And so the, the last thing I'll add here is just the source. So, Mapbox Satellite. And we're good. So once I save this, uh, it's asking me to have like a commit message. So similar to GitHub, you would give it some message so that's meaningful. Um, added building. And really, there's not much more information there that I can probably put, but that's it should be good. And when I save it, it creates a change set that can be reverted or um, somebody can go in and search for, by user and see all the change sets. And now if I just click view in OSM, there's the actual change set. And it should be live, you know, probably by the end of this talk. So, um, and you'll see it propagated in other, other maps as well. And you can see it tracks the editor, uh, the imagery used, I guess, was some latent data anyway, because that's separate from what you had typed in as source Mapbox satellite. So it knew what was under there. But then we created, we created a way, which is a, a, a multi-node polygon, and that is made of four nodes, which are the corners. And it's got the change set and all that sort of thing. And, and you could do multiples. You know, It's probably a better idea if you're adding like a block of buildings to do multiple buildings um, at once and set them in as one change set. Yeah, question. The question is, what happens if multiple people are editing? And that's a good question, because we thought we might run into that, too, if people start editing, <laughs> if we point everybody at the same small town. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with conflicts. Rafa, do you want to talk about that a bit? Well, it, it, those, those changes will appear. So, um, it, and then it just has to be reconciled by whoever you know, notices the change set. So if, if you're active in that area, you're going to see somebody else put it in the building. And uh, that, that happens from time to time, not, not too often, but um, it could happen at edit-a-thons. So what people will do is use something like a tasking manager to, to basically section off areas when they're, when they're working so that there's very little conflict. But if, if they do occur, then um, you can just go in and delete and then add the commit message that it was a duplicate. So. You also see, I don't know what made me remember this, but you also see a lot of odd things put into OSM. Like, do you remember that ship, the Costa Concordia? that crashed uh, in the Mediterranean a couple years ago, and it was on its side for a long while. Some people had added that to OpenStreetMap so that it showed up within like several minutes of that breaking in the news. It was showing up as a polygon, as a structure, and it had the right tagging and everything sitting off the coast uh, of uh, the island in the, in the Mediterranean. And I think it's gone now. But yeah, like that kind of transient data comes in, and it's interesting because a lot of people will uh, jump on opportunities uh, when events like that happen, to just add them to OpenStreetMap and make it a really rich data set that's different than a lot of other ones that you'll find. Um, yeah. so we have more edits, or are there, are there other questions about like the editor itself? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a change set, so you would you could go back and, and uh, put it back in if you needed to. Like, Right. Yeah, there's there's not a there's not a super strong infrastructure around versioning across the map like that. It really is based on these change sets. And the idea of OpenStreetMap is to be a reflection of the here and now, essentially at any given time. So you could do that sort of thing, but it's not the sort of thing where if you're familiar with Git, where you'd go in and do a hard reset to a past commit hash and just have a snapshot of the world because you know we're talking about like 400 gigs of of stuff, and so. It, you would have to reassemble it from change sets, or you could pull you can pull the polygon or you know geometric data back out of a change set and apply that if it's a missing feature. Um, you could do deltas and things like that. Uh, I'm not super familiar if there's any projects. I'm sure other people are looking into that because I know some people have been interested in doing this for ancient civilizations, and there's some spin-offs of OpenStreetMap. Like there's an open fantasy map, which is just like a fake world, but it's got the same scheme and all the same tools, and people are naming towns and just building continents and doing all kinds of stuff. But there's also stuff around ancient civilizations and, and turning modern-day ruins into the original structures at points in time. Um, yeah, I'll look up and see if I can find. I'm not familiar with any off the top of my head, but I know I've, I've heard of them before. But OSM's more designed about like the present day, hyper accurate right now sort of map. So, yes, yeah. So the question was around an activity like running, um, you generally want to know things like, uh, is it a multi-use path? Are there going to be cars next to me? Is it a separate sidewalk, separate running path, things like that. Um, and yeah, tagging is going to be the most useful thing there to add more metadata around it. There's not really this concept of separate layers in OSM. It's, it's like it's, it's just all there in the map. And in, in the OSM, you know, openstreetmap.org website viewer, it's, it's pretty much all or nothing, aside from turning notes on and off. But you could build any sort of application using the API that just like filters by tag or shows all the normal roads and then next to it shows certain taxonomy so that you could highlight running paths in that way. But there's not really a, a filter viewer on OpenStreetMap.org itself. Right, and um, a lot of the attributes are, if you look at some of the trail networks in and around Portland, there's, they do have, uh, whether it's, uh, ground surface, or uh, you'd have to look at the, the exact uh, map features, like what the taxonomy is, but um, yeah. Yeah, this is the Wildwood Trail in the West Hills, and you can see surface gr surface equals ground um, in that particular um, way that's highlighted. Also accessibility. Like Motor vehicles, no, that sort of thing. Definitely not. Um, Horses, unknown. Might, might see a horse there, you don't know. If you do, add it to the map. Here's another feature. Um, let's see. I want to. Where's the GPS trace? I know, uh, here I. So uh, I've just toggled on the GPS traces. So these are traces that people have uploaded uh, to OpenStreetMaps for either um, augmenting the existing map. So if you see here, these are traces along Northwest Cornell. Probably somebody driving. Lower McClay, there's a lot of, um, uh, not dithering, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of tricky to see. But uh, it is helpful for um, getting a, a pretty, um, com or some kind of confirmation of like where those trails actually are. And you'll see those in various places, but um, something interesting to turn on and actually look at. I believe it also indicates direction, so that's also helpful. Like if you're looking at streets and you want to add the direction, uh, whether it's like one way or something, you can actually tell by the color. So that'll help with tagging. Yeah, there's also um, on the running topic. There's some interesting tools. Uh, Strava, if you're familiar with them, the class of applications for tracking running and walking and things like that, bicycling. They actually forked the ID editor and built uh, a prototype editor called Slide which uses their data um, that they've collected on lots of runs and bikes and things to let you easily, more easily trace um, satellite imagery. So you can click points along a path, like pretty low resolution, like five points along uh, a running path, 
and then it will slide into place with maybe 60 or 70 or 100 different nodes composing the, the subtle turns in that path based on their most common data. There's some, some interesting things you can do for, for an editing interface as well. Um, it, yeah, in that case, they forked the ID project. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? So it's almost 11. Okay, we'll show a couple more things and maybe take a, take a break for some editing and getting up and stretch kind of thing before we, because we're a little over halfway through. And w one more thing I'll, I'll show that's uh, somewhat helpful when you're editing buildings, you can actually do a pretty sloppy job. And once you, let's see, where's the straighten tool? There's a, there's a way to sh kind of square off the corners there. So kind of helpful if you're just, you know, want to do some quick edits, but um, the ID editor has some fairly useful tools there for, for doing some quick edits. I'm going to remove that. Okay. So, was there another question in the back? Yeah, um, yeah, you would basically have to add it as multiple nodes to round it out, it's like a vector tool, so. Um, yeah, GPS traces are probably the main way to do that. Yeah, and that trace, trace is purely background, so you, would, you wouldn't, say, import it into the ID editor directly. That's when you would use something like QGIS or JOSM uh, to convert your GPX data to uh, OSM data and then push it back up. Do you want to do a break? Do an edit break? Yeah. Yeah, so let's take a break, um, get up and stretch if you want, and uh, we'll do some edits for maybe 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes, probably like 10 minutes. Let's do like five after. And um, if you have any questions, we'll come around, uh, get signed up for an account and start playing around with ID Editor. And um, if you want, you can go to uh, Shanico. Uh, it was, I'll put the, the name back up again, or it was uh, S-H-A-N-I-K-O, it's in Wasco County in Oregon. Um, and that's, well, here. Rafa's got it up. You can see it up here. Um, so that's a place we can add, although it looks like somebody did get to it in the last 24 hours. I'm kind of curious to see who, who the username is and what's going on. But um, yeah, feel free to play around tracing buildings, whether you save and commit it or not. One other thing I did want to mention is, so on the open source bridge site for this, the page for this session, it links off to the session notes. There's a wiki that open source bridge runs, and we can put session notes there. And I've already uh, kicked off and edited and added uh, Rafa and I's uh, OSM usernames there. So feel free if you've signed up for an account or you already have an account. Um, looks like Where Wombat got us. Um, um, if you uh, sign up for an account, feel free to add your OSM username to the wiki page for the session. And we were thinking of doing doing a before and after visualization if we can add some edits today and see see what it looks like before. Uh, before we got here. So yeah, let's take a couple minutes and feel free to raise your hand or come up or uh, we'll do some edits for a while. Yeah, let's shoot for like five, eight minutes after 11. We'll, uh, we'll get, go back and talk about uses of data and a little bit uh, in the programming side of stuff.
Anybody have any questions on editing with ID or anything? Um, yeah.
Um, okay, so I think we'll we'll get started again on some of the using the data and uh, doing some programming with it to show we show a, a pretty approachable example, even if you're not too much of a programmer. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about kind of the steps to using OSM data. Uh, basically, obviously, you want to get the data, and we'll talk a bit about some ways that you can get it out that aren't just the whole dump of all the data, like you were going to draw your own map. Um, you use it in applications via a number of different APIs or use of data formats, and then, like we mentioned earlier, it's important to attribute the data, which in the example will do, uh, that's automatic, but anytime you're pulling this data out, you want to make sure to say copyright OpenStreetMap contributors, um, even if you are one of them, because it belongs to the commons as a whole. Um, the example that we're going to show is uh, using mapbox.js, which is a, a JavaScript uh, library plugin, essentially, for a popular JavaScript library called Leaflet, um, which is also JavaScript. Uh, Leaflet, both of these are open source projects. Leaflet is in uh, probably the wi most widely used JavaScript web framework for displaying OSM data, um, whether that's map imagery or points and polygons on top of the imagery uh, that's a, at a separate layer. And so we're going to show that, and um, mostly because we know it well, and also um, it's hosted off of, a, off of a content network, so you don't have to download or install anything. You can reference it remotely in, in HTML and JavaScript. Um, and the other thing we're going to use to bring data into this is something called Overpass Turbo. This is the URL for it, overpass-turbo.eu. Um, Rafa, you want to talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um, so Overpass, the API itself, is a way to actually just query the data uh, directly out of OSM. So rather than rendering an entire uh, map from that query, you can just select very, um, very few features. So like we use the example amenity equal fountain, you can just extract all the fountains in a given area once you just supply like the bounding box. So it also allows you to uh, set a format for export. So if you wanted to use um, GeoJSON or KML or GPX, that's also available. So any, you know, any feature on OS OSM is available to export through this interface. And so this is, uh, we've got a code example up on GitHub, um, github.com slash mapbox slash OSB14. You can go clone this now. It's basically a small readme and an index.html file with JavaScript in it. Um, and you don't need to host this anywhere. This is a, we made it self-contained, so if you clone this down off of GitHub, uh, and uh, we'll take a, take a minute uh, for a coding break. By all means, raise your hand if you're not familiar with GitHub or cloning. Uh, you can also get it as a zip download. I'm happy to help anybody out. But um, when you bring this down, you'll have an index HTML that you can open in a text editor and start editing, and, uh, and we'll show this off. And also, you could just drag that into your web browser and read it locally off your hard drive without having to put it on a server. All the, all the functionality will work. It's, it's self-contained. It's basically referencing remote map tiles underneath and then putting some OSM data on top. So um, uh, I'll put this URL back up in a minute, but we'll do a quick coding break, and I'll also show on the, on the laptop Basically, we'll walk through the program and talk about everything from getting some of the stuff out of Overpass Turbo into a format that we can stick in the HTML file and, and charting it out. Um, so, yeah, that's the URL again. Um, if you could just go to github.com slash mapbox, it should be near the top because it's very recently edited. Um, and yeah, let me, uh, let me, you want me to do it? I'll do it on my laptop. Sure. Show, open it up. Yeah, let me, I'm going to open up the file and give you a sense of what's in there. Turbo uh, first. Let's bring that up. Over. Yeah. So when you go to um, Overpass Turbo, it's overpass-turbo.eu. Um, it should by default have the water fountain, the drinking water um, example. So the idea here is we're typing basically a query language 
So I mentioned, you know, there's a huge amount of data to OSM. If you just want to pull a slice of that off, this is a way to do it that we found is pretty approachable. So you can start exploring the data. Um, but the idea is on the left-hand side, you write a query, which will not be anywhere near as long as this, and the right-hand side will show your results. So if you go to the load button at the top, um, if it's not already like this, you can pick the, the drinking water example, and that will fill in that query in the left-hand side. So it's basically just saying it, it's looking for a key value where amenity equals drinking water. And so this is directly, this is the literal you know, tagging system used by OSM, amenity and drinking underscore water. And then the other thing that it automatically adds is this B-box query, which basically limits the search to the bounding box currently shown on the map, which makes sense. So you also want to use the search field up here to navigate to Portland. So for example, if I were off in San Francisco, um, like this, or anywhere else on the map, I just put in Portland. And this is also documented in the readme in that repository uh, of the steps. So we'll pick Portland. Let me zoom in. You can use a mouse wheel or double click to zoom in. So I'll show roughly downtown. And again, this is the super dense default open street map layer. So it's a little kind of busy in the map. But um, so here I'm searching for amenity equals drinking water. I'll hit run. It'll do that. And you can see these circles have appeared. And each of them is an actual OSM node with amenity equals drinking water. And it's got coordinates that are implicit to being stored in OSM. But this data set now visible based on the bounding box I just looked at, you can see down here, 33 nodes. No ways, no relations, because drinking fountains are nodes. And then you can do an export and get a, a number of various formats. So if I click GeoJSON from here, it opens up a new window. And this is a piece of parsable GeoJSON that has those 33 nodes in it. So this is a way to get a small slice of OSM data out. And I'll go through this again, just in case I'm moving too fast. But it's basically like an array of features. So feature this one. It's a node number. It's amenity drinking fountain or drinking water. It's got a name. It's got point coordinates. And so this is something you can bring into an application and start doing stuff with. Overpass also has APIs, so you could do more of a live query of this stuff rather than a one-time snapshot like I just did. But the basic idea is I turned a query for amenity equals drinking water into GeoJSON data with 33 nodes in it. Um, and so let me go over. So if you download the project off of GitHub, it looks something like this. It's got the readme file and some image, image screenshots in the folder to go along with it. But basically, it's an index.html. And uh, I'll bring that into my text editor uh, and show you what it looks like. Walk through it. Full screen there. Is that big enough font-wise for folks to see the code? So. It's an HTML file. It just pulls in Mapbox.js off of the website, so you don't have to modify any of this stuff. It sets up a div that has a map, and then it has a little bit of commentary here about the fact that I did this at Overpass Turbo. I ran this particular query, and I got out GeoJSON. And then you could just paste that GeoJSON from over here. You could just select it all and copy it under your clipboard and paste that starting right at the line with the bracket all the way down right into the source of the file. So I've got that exact literal thing pasted down to here. Um, and then a little bit of JavaScript that's basically showing a map off of Mapbox, uh, doing a little bit of styling. And I'll jump back in on this in a minute as we break out into it a bit. And then setting up some pop-ups on each of these points. Um, the basic gist of this is once I've pasted that uh, that GeoJSON in there, if I open this up in a local web browser, I get a map that has this OSM data with pop-ups. Um, and so what the example does out of the box is it shows the name of the fountain if it, if it came down with the node data. It uses the points to place it on the map, that you know the coordinates, and it also links the OSM node ID. So on any of these, when you've got the pop-up on there, you can click it, and it will open, open up that particular node in OpenStreetMap. Um, you can see that was edited five years ago. Amenity drinking water, it's got a name. You can see it on the map. And so every node in OSM has a website, has a web page, openstreetmap.org slash node slash the node number. So um, yeah, so that's basically what the example does out of the box. It gives you an interactive map, and you can start playing around with things. So um, I'll go through this in a little more detail, and then we could take a break and, and start dabbling with it, including running other queries if you're interested. Um, and I'll take questions in case I kind of went through anything too fast. But basically, the, 
beneath the GeoJSON in the file, we're setting up a map, centering it on Portland at, at a higher zoom level, basically. So this is the latitude and longitude of the middle of the map that I want. And then I'm, I'm iterating through the GeoJSON stuff that's pasted above and adding some custom properties that are used by mapbox.js. If you provide a color and a symbol, that's where the blue markers with water drops on them are coming from. It's basically mapbox.js knows how to do colors and it knows how to do a, a, a certain list of, of names of points. And if anybody's curious to change that, I can show you some more detail. Um, and then this part down below is just basically setting up that layer iterating through and setting up, setting a pop-up. So if you change out the data underneath um, and just paste in new GeoJSON points, you'll still get blue water uh, icons and then you can click on them and they'll show the name if they have a name and it'll let you link over to the OSM node. But it's, it's just a way to start playing with a subset of the data. In this case, the subset is that I'm only looking at amenity equals drinking water and by way of the, the method that I used to do the query on overpass, I only did it in that bounding box that I was looking at at the time um, where I was uh, over here on overpass looking at this particular view of Portland, these 33 nodes. Uh, that's basically kind of an implicit limit to the amount of data versus, um, you know, I could zoom out to the world and find all the world's drinking fountains. GeoJSON starts to be a bit of an unwieldy format for that sort of thing, but this is just something that's a little more approachable. So um, that's, a l that's a lot that I just blew through, especially if you're not a programmer. So I apologize, we can take a minute. And, and ba basically, um, let me see if there's anything else I was gonna, yeah, there's a couple other things to talk about afterwards, but I thought we could take a break. We have a few minutes, yeah, to take a break and, and do some coding exercises around this if anybody has a question of how to clone it or um, questions about editing the JavaScript. Uh, yeah, you have a question. Um, so the question is, uh, as far as data being unwieldy, is it possible to do on a global scale? It definitely is. Uh, it's just different tools for the job. Like, it, it, to do what we're doing here is basically taking point data in GeoJSON, which we mentioned real early on is not a super efficient format. The trade-off there is it's text readable, like we were just looking at it and it's comprehensible by humans. But um, adding like numbers of points in the browser is, it, it can be, it's not the most efficient way. Like 33 nodes, no problem. Hundreds of nodes, no problem. Thousands or millions of nodes, which is when you start talking on the global scale or, you're, or you start doing things with like all the streets in a country that you want to draw on a map. You generally don't do that in the browser with JavaScript. Um, so it's the kind of thing where you'll do different tool sets where you'll start looking into a map renderer that can render tiles. So for example, if you go back over to the example that we've set up here, I mentioned that all of Mapbox's maps are based off of OpenStreetMap. So what you're seeing under the pins here is um, as a default Mapbox style. You can see the attribution in the corner, copyright Mapbox, copyright OpenStreetMap, with a link off to edit it directly. But these map tiles are generated using, we pull down all that real time, all that OSM data, and then curate it into what we want to show at various zoom levels and make maps out of it. And that kind of gets in the territory of map tile rendering. So if you look, like if I right click anywhere here and open the image in a new tab, um, you can see what a map tile looks like. And that, that is an image that was produced by a different tool set using a much larger volume of OSM data on, on, a, you know, on, a, on a city or a worldwide scale in this case. So there's lots of other things you can do with it. What it, we kind of wanted to highlight was a JavaScript example that keeps it all in the browser, all in one place, both the data and the code to easily put some points, which are relatively lightweight. You know, points are a lot easier to draw than polygons because when you get into larger scale stuff, you have to simplify polygons so that you don't have such complicated structures to draw on the fly. But um, we're happy to talk about the tools for doing this sort of thing afterwards. It's a little out of the scope because you, you could do whole workshops on how to make map tiles and tools for it and that sort of thing. But um, basically, yeah, we're, we're keeping it to a relatively simple point-based demo like this. Um, any other? Kind of group style questions before we break for a bit and play around with the JavaScript? Oh, yeah. So we have 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, let's take a couple minutes. I'll put a, the URL again for cloning the example if you didn't grab it already and we can, um, you can dabble or just, you know, feel free to play with overpass, um, querying data back out, taking a look at the GeoJSON, that sort of thing, on down to pasting that into the source file and, and visualizing it. I'll go back to the 
this is the URL for, for downloading that project. If you're not familiar with GitHub, if you go to this URL, there should be a link on the right-hand side that just says download zip. You can download a zip file of this stuff. You don't have to clone it. Um, yeah, question. Yeah, the slides, um, we'll put like a PDF of them on the, on the session notes for, the, for, the, um, for this session and the, wiki, the OS Bridge wiki. And uh, we'll probably tweet about them too. Um, but yeah, we'll link it over. Is it, question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this kind of speaks to the, the, the moderation part of the community. It works in a similar model. Like, it, it goes back to the idea, this doesn't solve all problems, but it goes back to the idea that local knowledge is preferred. But, you know, if there's a conflict, <laughs> both sides have local knowledge. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's politics to it, too. And, and even in the case of, like, Mapbox as a corporate entity, we've had to take sides on, on certain data as we make cartographic decisions. So, yeah, it, it can get complicated, but the community, uh, there is a moderation community in place, and so, uh, you know, particularly hot areas are, uh, yeah, like Kashmir is another good example between India and Pakistan. Um, yeah, there, there's community in, in place. If that's an area that you're interested in, you can become involved with that community within OSM that works through issues surrounding that. And there's also the ability to, you know, export the data and make derivative works of it too that represent a particular viewpoint and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it's not an area I'm super familiar with, but I'm pretty sure, like, just e even besides whatever uh, side of a conflict or decision the the state of OpenStreetMap reflects, they usually do also tag these areas so that people are aware that there's some issues, political issues or otherwise, around the way it's mapped right now. Um, but yeah, being a being a world you know world organization and uh, you know there's different points of view, so. It is. It, it's. It's. It runs pretty similarly to Wikipedia as far as like things being locked down when when uh, an area goes into conflict and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I'll just go back. So the um, the area I chose was. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and let's see, below a number of these ways here, and here is uh, let's see, border disputed between China and India, so yeah, there's two borders there, so you may see these uh, reflected in, in uh, some of the change sets or, or at, in the current state of the map, so. Yeah, I mean, it's a reflection of the geography of the place, too. So um, let me go back here real quick. Um, anybody have any questions on the JavaScript, the GeoJSON overpass stuff? Um, yeah, and like I said, by all means, come talk to us afterwards, and we can add some links and resources in the um, session notes as well about other uses besides just bringing data down as points, like, for example, bringing way data, like you could bring... You could filter out parks in Portland and put those as an overlay on your map where you can toggle them on or off or style them how you like and things like that. Um, coding break. So yeah, to wrap up, a um, couple next actions for OSM specific stuff. Uh, feel free to keep improving or start improving OSM with your edits. You can do this anywhere, anytime. Uh, like we said, local knowledge is more important. So if you know a place like a town you grew up in or something like that, or a place you visited or a place you're on vacation right now, stuff like that, and you wish there were better maps, you can make there be better maps. Um, you can keep your eyes peeled for edit-a-thons and other ways, uh, kind of lower impact ways to contribute. Uh, the OpenStreetMap community in Portland is pretty strong, so you'll frequently see um, on the various geo mailing lists or things like Caligator, uh, caligator.org, uh, the Portland Tech Calendar, um, ways to get together. I think they do at least quarterly sit-downs um, of just, like, improving parts of Portland. Um, and I know Rafa's been involved with the, the project, the PDX Building Import, which you mentioned earlier, which is a kind of an ongoing thing. Um, you want to mention kind of where that's at and what exactly you're doing? Yeah. Uh, so the 
like I said, the city of Portland and uh, and Metro are are both very excited about putting their data into OpenStreetMap. So uh, we have this opportunity to um, make a large import, and uh, it's going to require a, a good bit of effort from the community. So we're going to have probably a sprint where we're bringing in data as as we see fit, and where there are conflicts, those will need to be resolved, like existing buildings that are out there. And also, um, you know, just vetting the names because they're going to attach um, addresses with them as well. So, um, but once you see that, you're going to see the the landscape uh, across Portland change quite a bit. So, pretty exciting. Um, should I'll I mention the yeah, next? Oh, the building stuff is really neat because I know in Portland, like downtown and Lloyd Center and some of the more core areas are covered really well. I live down in Southeast, buildings aren't covered there, but the, the city has the database of all the buildings, you know, for tax lots and stuff. So it's really exciting to have that kind of data come in in a more mass scale. But it takes a lot of massaging, as you can imagine, with all these things, make sure it's all accurate. So um, for coding next actions, we had some ideas uh, on things you can do if you're interested in this kind of uh, geospace. There's a, there's a TriMet hackathon tonight as part of OS Bridge. Uh, I think it's in the Hacker Lounge. Uh, so it's not specific to OpenStreetMap, but there's lots of potential overlap for using OSM data along with the new TriMet APIs or just using OSM data as reflects and things related to TriMet or just other geo people are going to be there too. So it's, that's something to check out as part of Open Source Bridge. Uh, you should definitely talk about MapTime. Uh, uh, MapTime is a event that we host uh, monthly at ESRI uh, headquarters here, the Research and Development Center. And it's basically time for mapping. So if uh, you have projects, you have um, data that you have questions about or anything that you want to work with that's kind of geo-related, it's a really good time to talk with other folks and connect with them and uh, basically work on any kind of Cardo project, whether it's some JavaScript, uh, tile mill, or um, some sort of GIS uh, solution that you're looking for. A wide range of, of folks, different levels of experience from never just interested in geo stuff, never done anything, on up to working in geo as, as a part of day job sort of thing. So super helpful community, and that's that's a really fun event. Um, we just published an article in uh, on the Mapbox site in, as part of our foundation series, which is kind of like the building blocks of how Mapbox fits together, where we talk about what exactly we do with OSM. I mentioned that all of our world maps, like the base map underneath that JavaScript example, are all rendered off of near real-time OSM data, um, where if you make edits, so if we go to Shenico, like that stuff will be on Mapbox maps now, the stuff that we've added today. Um, and so we talk a bit about process and also how we work with the community and, and are involved with coding efforts, like making the ID editor and making the website better, better and things like that. And I should mention also, we have a coupon code for everybody at Open Source Bridge for Mapbox. If you're interested in um, uh, styling your own maps. Uh, I mentioned this a bit in the readme, in the code example. So the base map underneath, you can change anything you want about that. And that's basically what Mapbox specializes on is, is um, customization tools around making custom maps. And also some of the larger volume stuff. Uh, Dale, is it? Yeah, the Dale was asking about with like rendering, rendering data out of, uh, rendering maps out of much heavier data sets. Um, we have a lot of tools, open source tools for that. And uh, if you need a place to host those or a way to integrate with your app, um, you can sign up with this coupon code and, and also just come talk to us about what we presented or anything else around this. Like I said, I'm the mobile lead. I do mostly iOS development, but I'm familiar with all our mobile related stuff, Android, mobile web stuff as well, uh, and developer tools. So um, feel free to come and talk to us. And uh, yeah, I think we just nailed it on the time. So thanks for coming. This is us on Twitter. Uh, thank you. Thank you.